In this video, I'm going to go through the most common problems I find in how people analyze their ERP data. There are a million ways to analyze ERP data and a million ways to make mistakes, but I'm going to focus on inappropriate filtering, problems with quantifying the amplitudes and latencies of the ERP components, and statistical problems. These are the most common analysis problems that I see. Let's start with filtering. Recall that low-pass filters are used to attenuate high-frequency noise, like muscle activity and induced activity from electrical devices in the recording environment. High-pass filters are used to attenuate low-frequency noise, like skin potentials. We can think about filtering in the frequency domain. A filter has a frequency response function, which indicates how much it passes versus attenuates any given frequency. In my lab, we like to use frequency response functions that are pretty gradual, like this one. That's because of fundamental principle number two. Precision in the frequency domain is inversely related to precision in the time domain. So the more heavily you filter the data, and the sharper your filter is, the more temporal resolution you've lost. And isn't temporal resolution one of the greatest virtues of the ERP technique? But even more importantly, heavy filtering can produce problematic distortions. Low-pass filters tend to distort the onset and offset time of the ERPs. Extreme high-pass filters can cause artificial peaks to appear in the waveforms. But some filtering is necessary. Here are my concrete guidelines for when you should and shouldn't worry about the filter settings in an ERP paper. Now let's move on to inappropriate amplitude or latency measures. If you remember back to Felix's aversive conditioning study, he measured the late positive potential as the mean amplitude between 350 and 650 milliseconds. He literally took the voltage at each time point in this range and averaged those voltages together. That's a very common way of quantifying the amplitude of an ERP component. Another common approach is to find the peak voltage in each condition. I'm not a fan of using the peak. Why should we care when the voltage reaches a maximum? The ERP component and the underlying neurocognitive process are extended over time. Also, peaks are really distorted by high-frequency noise, which reduces statistical power. See how noise has distorted the peak amplitude of this waveform? Another problem with peak amplitude is that it's biased by the noise level. The noisier the data, the bigger the peak. For example, here we're looking at identical waveforms, except the bottom one has noise added to it. See how the peak of the noisy waveform is 27.6 microvolts, whereas the peak of the clean waveform is 20 microvolts? So, it's not valid to compare peak amplitudes in two groups or conditions where the noise level differs. This can occur when you're comparing a patient group to a control group, or when one condition has more trials than the other. However, mean amplitude isn't biased by the noise level. Noise is equally likely to make the mean amplitude larger or smaller. So peak amplitude gets consistently larger as the waveforms get noisier, but mean amplitude doesn't. It isn't necessarily a problem if a paper uses peaks, it's pretty common. But you should make sure that there's no reason to expect noisier data in one group or condition than in the other. Now let's turn to statistical problems. There are lots of potential statistical issues in any study, whether or not it's an ERP study. But the main problem I see in ERP studies is an inflation of the false positive rate. It's just too easy to find bogus but significant effects if you're not careful. As we discussed in a previous video, this problem arises when researchers look at the data and use the observed effects to decide on what time windows and electrode sites to use in their analyses. When they do that, they can almost always find a significant effect that's just a result of noise. In Felix's study, he could use previous research to choose the time window and electrode site. But Risa couldn't do that. Before she saw the data, she had no idea that she'd see a PD component. So she couldn't use previous research to make an a priori decision about how to analyze the PD effect. So she just used the same electrode sites for the PD as she used for the N2PC, and she picked a time window that seemed reasonable. But that's not really good enough. If we just had this one experiment, I'd be worried that this is one of those bogus but significant results. That's one of the reasons that the paper includes multiple follow-up experiments that replicated the results using the same electrode sites and time window. So, if a study doesn't have a good justification for the electrode sites and time window, you should be cautious about the results until you see a replication. 